Hello, this is the third lecture in my sequence of video lectures on robust statistics. In this class, we will consider robust mean estimation for the first time in the high dimensional setting. So let's recall the two univariate learning problems we considered in the first two lectures. I claim that there will be natural high dimensional analogs of both. So the first problem we considered was as follows. Here there was some unknown mean, which is a real number, and we were given an epsilon cup to set of samples from a Gaussian with that mean and variance 1. Then the goal was to, given the set of samples, output some mu hat which is close to mu. And recall for this problem we show that the right answer is theta of epsilon, at least if n is sufficiently large. So what's the high dimensional analog of this problem? Uh, so now, instead of having an unknown mean, which is a real number, we just have an unknown mean vector living in our d. And again, we are given an epsilon corrupt set of samples. But now from a d-dimensional Gaussian with that mean, and now we need to specify a covariance matrix. And for now, we will just take the identity so that this Gaussian has variance 1 in every direction. Later on, we'll see how to relax this. And now again, the goal is to output some mu hat, which is close to mu. But in high dimensions, we need to specify what the norm is. Uh, and it turns out, as we'll see later, that the right answer is we should consider the L2 norm. Uh, and we'll make this more formal later on, but this shouldn't be too surprising simply because in some sense Gaussians are naturally L2 objects. So that's the first high dimensional problem we will consider. The second problem we considered before was the following. Here again we had some unknown mean, which was a real number, uh, and we had a distribution, d, with mean mu and variance uh, sigma squared, which is at most 1. And the goal was to, again, given an epsilon corrupted set of samples from this distribution, uh, output some mu hat, which is close to mu. And in this setting, recall we showed that the right answer was theta of root epsilon. So what is the high dimensional analog of this problem? Again, we have some mean vector living in Rd. And again, we have a distribution, capital D, over R little d, with this mean. And now we need to specify not just its variance, but again, its covariance matrix. And the natural analog of this, I claim, is that it has a covariance matrix sigma, and its spectral norm of sigma is at most 1. Or in other words, all the eigenvalues of sigma are at most 1. So this just says that along every univariate projection, this distribution has variance at most 1. And now again, the goal is to, given an epsilon cup to set samples from this distribution, uh, output some mu hat, minimizing the distance to mu. And for this problem, just as before, I claim that the natural measure of distance is the L2, uh, L2 norm. Again, this shouldn't be surprising because the spectral norm assumption uh, is an assumption about eigenvalues and eigenvectors, which are naturally uh, L2 objects as well. OK, so it will turn out that for both of these problems, uh, the same error rates are going to apply asymptotically. So given enough samples, we can also still achieve theta of epsilon error and theta of root epsilon error for problems 1 and 2, respectively. However, doing so will be a little bit more uh, complicated and will require a little bit more nuance. I should first note, however, that the lower bounds for these problems are not very hard. The lower bounds follow almost immediately from the one-dimensional learning problems. Really, the problem will be to achieve the corresponding upper bound. So to see why this is complicated, let's first analyze several natural estimators and see why they don't achieve these rates. In particular, they will get rates which scale poorly with the dimension. So the first thing to try is to learn things coordinate-wise. So just to reduce a d-dimensional problem to d one-dimensional problems. So let's consider for now the problem of learning uh, the mean of a Gaussian, so problem 1. So here we have some unknown mean vector mu. I can write it in its coordinates, mu sub 1 through mu sub d. And if x is a Gaussian, or is a draw from Gaussian with this mean, uh, and variance or covariance identity, I should say. Uh, the next, I can also write it in its coordinates. And one important property of Gaussians is that the ith coordinate of x will be distributed as a univariate Gaussian with mean mu sub i and variance 1. So that means if I have an epsilon cup to set of samples from this d dimensional Gaussian, I also have uh, d epsilon corrupted samples from univariate Gaussians. And so I can just run my one-dimensional estimator, so like the median, on each one of these one-dimensional problems, and I'll get something. So in particular, if I do so, I'll get an estimator, mu hat, 
which is mu hat 1 through mu hat d. And the guarantees of my one dimensional estimator is that for all i, we have that mu hat i minus mu i is theta of epsilon. And this is the best we can ever hope to do if we're using a univariate estimator. But then when we actually put these things together, we actually get a pretty bad error because this implies that the L2 error between mu and mu hat, well, it's epsilon every coordinate, and there's d coordinates. So this is actually theta of epsilon root d. And this root d factor uh, is pretty bad. So first of all, it's not statistically optimal. It scales poorly with the dimension. And worse, in practice, this is really killer. So you know, nowadays, our dimensionality is often quite large. Maybe say 10,000 is pretty small. And that factor is really huge here. So it really swamps the air. Okay, So this is bad. And this is the sort of thing we're going to try to avoid. So let's see another thing which suffers from the same loss, which is the truncated mean. So the thing that worked actually in one dimension which will not work quite so well in high dimensions. So what does the truncated mean in high dimensions? The sort of only natural thing to do is just remove things which are too far away in L2 norm from the true mean. The problem is that in high dimensions, the norm of a vector is actually very noisy. In particular, things will be typically very, very far away from their expectations. So again, let's consider uh, problem one. So robustly learning the mean of a Gaussian. And here we have the following fact. So if x is a Gaussian, with mean mu invariance identity, then in fact the L2 norm of x, or the L2 distance of x from its mean, will concentrate very strongly around root d. So formally, uh, the probability that the square distance between x and mu differs from d by something which is like t root d is exponentially small. So in other words, with a very, very high probability, the square distance will be very close to d. Or in other words, the, the L2 distance without the square will be about root d. Pictorially, what this means is the following. So in, in low dimensions, let's say two dimensions, we typically think of Gaussians as being quite close to the mean. So if the mean here is 0, then what we think of is that there's some points which are sort of far away, but most of the points are pretty close to the mean. And so if, let's say, some of these points are corrupted, well, the outliers can't actually do very much. Like either if they're too far away, then they're like obviously outliers, and we can throw them away. Um, and if they're close by, well, then there's only an epsilon fraction of them. And they can't actually change our estimate of the empirical mean too much. However, this picture changes quite dramatically in high dimensions because of this fact. Because now the picture is that in high dimensions, actually almost all of our good points lie within this radius of or the circle or donut or whatever you want to call it, of radius root d away from the mean. And now the picture is quite different because actually the bad points can all just sort of hide within this donut of radius root d, and each individual bat point will look just fine. Each individual bat point was actually the same distance away from the mean as the good points. Previously, in the low dimensional setting, we had an epsilon fraction of points. Each one could maybe contribute, you know, okay, at most something like a logarithmic factor, so they couldn't screw up our estimate of the empirical mean by too much. But now we have an epsilon fraction of points, and each one is root d away from the mean. And you, when you work it out, and it's not too hard, what you get is you're going to get an error, which is omega of root d. So the same loss as before. And sort of, uh, this should sort of convince you of two things, which is that there's a bunch of estimators that don't work. So in particular, other things that don't work include some notions of median, like geometric median. But more generally, pretty much anything that uses L2 distance, so a bunch of these outlier detection methods won't work. And more generally, anything which looks for outliers on sort of an individual basis won't be able to get past the root d error. That's because, again, here in this picture, each individual point uh, in the picture on the right looks just fine. Each individual red point looks just fine. It's sort of the aggregate behavior that will cause this epsilon root d. So in the remainder of this lecture, I will give two estimators which are able to get past this barrier at epsilon root d, in fact, to get the right answer. However, they are more sophisticated. And they will pay for their sophistication very concretely uh, in their computational complexity. And then in the following lectures, we'll actually also get uh, around this issue as well. However, uh, this will be, this will require much more additional work. Okay, but for now, let's just consider these. So recall that in one dimension for the Gaussian learning problem, the median worked. However, 
the coordinate wise median does not work. And it turns out that this following notion of median, uh, the two key median, is actually the right high dimensional analog of the median for this problem, at least from the statistical point of view. So the idea is instead of just finding a point which is a median along the d coordinate bases, find a point which is a median along every univariate projection. So this is this was introduced, I should say, in a paper by Tukey back in 1975, a very important a foundational paper in the field of robust statistics. So to do this, let's first uh, let, we will do this in two steps. So first, I want to define the notion of Tukey depth. So definition: given a set of points S, uh, a finite set of points in R D, and a point eta, not necessarily in S, we can define the Tukey depth of eta denoted this way uh, using the following expression. But it's probably easier to explain in words. What I want to do is I'm going to take the set of all half spaces which go through eta, and I'm going to find the one which contains the fewest points in S. And then the depth of my points is simply the number of points uh, in that half space over n. Intuitively, if my point is on the outside of my set S, it's very easy to find a half space which doesn't go, which doesn't contain any points in S. Alternatively, if my point is very deep within uh, my set of points, it's not so easy to find such a half space. And indeed, you won't be able to find a half space which uh, doesn't contain very many points. So let's perhaps do an example uh, to give some intuition. So S here is a set of black points. And I have these two points, eta 1 and eta 2. Let's compute their depths. OK, so eta 1 intuitively is, is clearly on the outside of the set of points. And indeed, we can find a subspace, in fact, a bunch of subspaces that go through eta, two, eta 1. For instance, this one, which contains no points in S. So the depth of eta 1 with respect to S is 0, which makes sense because it is not deep within S. On the other hand, this point eta 2 is clearly uh, much more inside this set. And indeed, I can't find any half space which uh, doesn't contain some set of points. I think something the best is something like. Uh, Ooh, actually, I don't know. <laughs> Something like this, perhaps, uh, which contains six points in S. So the depth of eta 2 is, I believe, 6 over 15. So two fifths. So intuitively, eta 1 is much more outside of my set of points than eta 2. And notice that this act of looking at half spaces formally is actually looking at univariate projections. So this is asking for a point. Um, which along every univariate projection uh, has some points to the right of it. Okay, then given this set of, or this definition of depth, the Tukey median is simply the point which achieves the maximum depth. Uh, in computational geometry, you also see this called the center point. Then the theorem is as follows. So suppose I have an epsilon compass set of samples um, from Gaussian a d-dimensional Gaussian with mean, mu, and covariance identity. And let's assume epsilon is at most 1 6th. Then what you can show is that there exists some c greater than 0, such that with high probability, the Tukey mean of s minus mu in L2 norm uh, is at most phi inverse of 1 half plus this expression, 3 epsilon plus c squared d plus log over delta over n. So let me parse this very briefly. So first of all, again, notice that if n is sufficiently large, this term gets swamped by this term. So this is really phi inverse of 1 half plus 3 epsilon, at least when n is sufficiently large. And recall from the first lecture, uh, phi, which I've drawn here, uh, is quite smooth around 1 half. It's 0 at 1 half and smooth around it. And so at least when epsilon is relatively small, this is order of epsilon. So this is for epsilon sufficiently small and n sufficiently large. So here we need n to be something at least omega of d plus log 1 over delta over epsilon squared. But it turns out actually that this is the right statistical rate as well. So observe that uh, order epsilon error is the best we could ever hope for because we have a univariate lower bound of epsilon. And actually d plus this rate, d plus log 1 over delta over epsilon squared is the right uh, scaling for n as well. So this estimator actually is minimax optimal for this problem. So let's prove this theorem. 
Uh, and I will give a quote unquote proof. I will ignore some issues of concentration just for simplicity. Concretely, what I'll do is the following. So recall that S can be written as S of good union S of bad set minus S of R, where S of good is a set of N I D samples from regression with mean mu and covariance identity. I will assume star, which says that in words, uh, for every half space, the fraction of points in S of good which lie within this half space is exactly equal to the expected number uh, of points, given that X is a set of NID samples from a Gaussian with mean, oops, this should be mu, and covariance identity. So formally, a half space in RD can be specified by a unit vector direction V uh, and a shift vector eta in RD. And you are in this half space if and only if x minus eta in a product V is greater than or equal to zero. So star is just saying that for every such choice of eta and V, the fraction of points which are which satisfy this property is exactly the expected number of points, which is simply the probability given x drawn from a Gaussian with mean mu and covariance identity that x minus eta in a product V is at least zero. And this uh, simplifies a little bit because I can uh, do a little uh, shift so I can write x is equal to z plus mu, so that z has is just a Gaussian of mean zero and covariance identity. So this is the probability that uh, z, after doing a little bit of rewriting, z inner product v exceeds uh, eta minus mu v. Okay, but since z uh, has covariance identity and is mean zero, z inner product v is actually just a standard normal Gaussian in one dimension. So this is just the probability that a standard normal Gaussian exceeds a value, which is simply phi of that value. Mu, excuse me. So this is a, an expression that will be very useful later on. So we will prove this in two parts now, assuming uh, this uh, assumption. First, we will show that the depth of the true mean is quite large. So to do so, fix any unit vector v. So let v have unit norm, and let's just count the fraction of points uh, which are in the half space specified by v and mu. So let's just count the number of points in s such that x minus mu in a product v uh, is non-negative. Well, I can break this up into three parts because this is just the number of points in S sub good satisfying this property minus the number of points in S sub bad satisfying this property satisfying the same thing plus the set or excuse me I need to add the number of points in S sub bad and I need to subtract the number of points in S sub bar which satisfy this property because I'm removing those points To this property. Okay, but I want to lower bound this, so I can just ignore this contribution because it's only going to contribute some non negative number. Uh, and this term here, I can upper bound uh, by negative epsilon n simply because the number of points in S of removed is at most epsilon n. So overall, this says that this is less than or equal to the number of points uh, in S of good which satisfy this property. minus epsilon n. But now by star, this assumption that we're making, which is not quite valid, but close enough, and we'll show how to remove this later on, uh, this is exactly phi of 0, because I'm actually centering at mu, which means that this overall thing is phi, uh, excuse me, simply 1 half or sorry, it's phi of 0 times n, which is 1 half times n minus epsilon n. And this implies immediately that the depth of Sn, or sorry, S mu, well, for any half space, the number of points is at least uh, n over 2 minus epsilon n, so the fraction of points in that uh, subspace is at least 1 half minus epsilon, which is exactly the definition of depth. So the depth of mu under this assumption is at least one half minus epsilon. Great. 
So now we have some lower bound in the objective value. And all we need to show now is the following claim, which is that if eta is far from mu in L2 norm by at least this amount, uh, then the depth of eta will be too small. And these two things will immediately imply that the, the true two key mean, or median, excuse me, will be close to mu. So how do we upper bound the two key depth at this point? Well, let's see what happens to any half space passing through this point. So for any unit vector v, let's count the number of points in x which satisfy uh, in S, sorry, we satisfy that x minus uh, eta in the product of v is greater than or equal to zero. Well, as before, I can decompose this into three parts. Uh, I will abbreviate this. I can write this as the number of points in S of good, which satisfy this property, plus the number of points in S of bad, which satisfy this property. And again, I should subtract the number of points in S sub removed that satisfy this property. I'm going to want an upper bound, so I can just actually freely ignore this because this is only going to make it smaller. And I can upper bound this by epsilon n because that's the number of points in S sub bad. So overall, and then invoking star, uh, I can say that this is less than or equal to n times phi. of eta minus mu inner product b plus epsilon n. So I'm going to want to upper bound this quantity by choosing v um, as best as I can. And to do so, clearly I want to minimize the quantity inside this uh, function. So then I'm therefore just going to choose v to be mu minus eta over the L2 norm of this vector. And so what I get is that the depth is at most n times phi of minus uh, eta minus mu L2 norm plus epsilon n. But recall our assumption uh, on the L2 norm difference is it's at least this. And by you know these tricks with symmetry of a Gaussian, it's not hard to conclude that this implies that this is at most n times 1 half minus 3 epsilon, from which we conclude that the total number of points uh, for this choice of half space, which lie in this half space, is at most 1 half minus 2 epsilon quantity times n, which implies that the two key, uh, two key depth of this point is at most 1 half minus 2 epsilon. Particularly, this is less than 1 half minus epsilon, which is what we wanted to show. So good. So now we have these two claims. First of all, that the objective value um, attained by the true mean is actually quite large. It's at least 1 half plus epsilon. And moreover, or sorry, 1 half minus epsilon. And moreover, if you're too far away uh, from the mean, your depth is too small. Sorry, don't know what happened there. And that, that concludes the proof. These two uh, claims together immediately imply that the two key depth, or sorry, two key median of s minus mu cannot exceed one half plus three epsilon. But of course, we are assuming this uh, this condition star, which is unrealistic. And what we need to do to actually get this to work under finally many samples is to somehow relate uh, these two quantities in a much more quantitative way. So currently, recall we're assuming that the number of points on any, or the fraction of points on any side of a half space is exactly the expected number. This is of course not going to true is not going to be true uh, with any finite number of samples. However, it turns out that there is a concentration with this sort of phenomena. So we're going through empirical process theory. Um, in fact, it is a, a theorem that you can find in a paper by Bartlett and Mendelssohn that with high probability, if I take enough samples. So the difference between the uh, fraction of points which lie within any half space and the expected number of points is exactly the discrepancy in star uh, for real data is bounded asymptotically, or up to constants, excuse me, by this uh, rate, which is square root of d plus log root over delta over n. And again, this holds for all half space simultaneously with probability 1 minus delta. 
So then if I just go through this proof one more time, and I just introduce a slack factor of root d plus log 1 over delta over n, uh, you'll see that actually the same conclusions hold. Uh, I just need to add a little bit in this guarantee here. So I need to have a little bit more slack here, uh, allowing for this square root d plus log 1 over delta over n term. And if I do so properly, you'll actually just get uh, the theorem exactly. So this concludes the proof of the Tukey median. In this lecture, I want to go through one more estimator, um, which will work in the setting of bounded moments. And this will be related to the problem or the notion of bounded cores. So this is a notion uh, called resilience, which was introduced more recently in a paper by Steinhardt Charakar Valiant in 2018. And it is the following. So definition, let D be a distribution over RD with mean mu. Let sigma epsilon be greater than zero. So we say that D is sigma comma epsilon resilient. If for all events E, such that the probability of this event under D exceeds one minus epsilon, we have the following. The expectation of X conditioned on this event uh, differs from the true mean by most sigma in L2. So this is a property of a distribution. To relate this to finite data sets, we say that a finite set of points is sigma comma epsilon resilient if the uniform distribution with a set of points is sigma comma epsilon resilient. So this is a bit abstract, but uh, we'll instantiate this a bit later in the setting of bounded second moments. But let's see why this is interesting. And the main reason why this is interesting comes from the following theorem. So let sigma be greater than zero and let epsilon be at most a fourth. And now I'm going to let s be essentially an epsilon cup set of points, except instead of assuming that s sub good, or s sub g, uh, is an IID sample of points from some nice distribution, I'm going to make a deterministic assumption about it. I'm going to assume that it is sigma comma 2 epsilon resilient. Okay, and throughout this I will also denote the size of s by n. So I'm going to assume uh, Formally, that s is equal to s of good, union s of bad, set minus s of bar, where s of good is this sigma comma 2 epsilon resilient set. And again, s of bar is a set of points in s of good, and the number of points removed and added is at most epsilon times the size of s. Under these assumptions, the theorem states the following. If I take mu sub good to be the empirical mean of s of good, then there is an admittedly inefficient algorithm, which given the corrupted set of points, outputs a mu hat which is close in L2 norm to the mean of the good points. So the error is at most 2 sigma. So the proof of this will go in two parts. So the first claim is that if s of good is sigma comma 2 epsilon resilient, then s of good set minus s of bar is still resilient with slightly worse parameters. It is sigma comma epsilon over 1 minus epsilon resilient. So let's see why. So what's the definition of resilience for a set of points again? It is simply uh, that the uniform distribution over that set of points is, is sigma comma epsilon over 1 minus epsilon resilient. Uh, to show that the uniform distribution is resilient, we just need to show that the mean does not change if I remove a small fraction of points. So formally, suppose E is an event for the uniform distribution over s a good set minus s a bar with probability at least 1 minus this quantity epsilon over 1 minus epsilon which we can simplify slightly to be 1 minus 2 epsilon over 1 minus epsilon. That means that E is a collection of points in s of good set minus s a bar uh, so I can just say E is Let's just relate. Let's just uh, identify E with the set of points, and the key property is that the set of points must have size at least one minus two epsilon over one minus epsilon times s sub good set minus s sub bar. Let's just say at least because that's what it means to have that amount of probability under the uniform distribution. Well, I can just write this out slightly because this is one minus two epsilon over one minus epsilon times the size of good, s sub good minus s sub bar. But this is epsilon n. 
So this whole thing becomes 1 minus 2 epsilon over 1 minus epsilon times 1 minus epsilon times size of s good, which is just 1 minus 2 epsilon times size of s good. So that means if E is an event with probability at least uh, 1 minus 2 epsilon over 1 minus epsilon uh, over the uniform distribution in s of good, set minus s of r, it corresponds to a set of points of size at least 1 minus 2 epsilon times size of s of good. And this is a set of points that lies strictly within s of good. Meaning that E can also be thought of as an event over the, for the uniform distribution over s of good with probability at least 1 minus 2 epsilon. And for any such event, we know that the mean shifts by not that much. OK, cool. I guess actually, technically, uh, this should be in 2 epsilon here because we will have to use a triangle inequality. Because what we know to complete the proof is that the mean of mu sub good minus mu of s of good sub minus s of r. So there's just the empirical mean of s of good minus s of r. This differs by most sigma simply because uh, we, we know that s of good sub minus s of r is a set which is quite large. It is, it is size at least 1 minus epsilon. So it, it corresponds to an event with probably at least 1 minus epsilon uh, for the uniform distribution of s, s sub good. And we also know that mu sub good minus mu sub uh, e is at most sigma because e is an event with probability at least 1 minus 2 epsilon. So combining these two, uh, we get that the empirical mean of mu sub good minus mu sub r differs from mu sub, uh, the empirical mean of mu sub good by most 2, eps, two sigma. Hmm. 2 sigma. Okay, which is what we want to show, I guess, originally with slightly worse parameters. But uh, we won't worry about these constants here. So that's the first claim. Now the, uh, the proof is finished with the second claim, which is that if T is any subset of S, not of S of good, but of S, the Krupta set, which is 2 sigma comma epsilon over 1 minus epsilon resilient, and if mu hat is the empirical mean of this set of points, and this set of points is sufficiently large, size at least 1 minus epsilon n, then the empirical mean of mu hat minus mu sub good uh, in L2 norm can be at most, I suppose this is probably, oops, 4. 4 times sigma. OK, and the reason why I claim this is true fo will follow essentially from a pigeonhole principle. The idea is as follows. So by assumption, we know that T has size at least 1 minus epsilon times n. And moreover, we know that the set of points in S of good that are within S, which is this S of good set minus S of r, also has size at least 1 minus epsilon n by the assumption uh, on S. But these two things together imply that the intersection of these two things must be quite large. Because these are two sets which are huge. Think of epsilon as being very small. Uh, this says that the size of their intersection is at least something like 1 minus 2 epsilon times n. And then we are almost done. Because by the uh, 2 sigma comma epsilon over 1 minus epsilon resilience of t, a straightforward calculation demonstrates that the empirical mean of t, which I guess I was denoting previously as mu hat, minus the empirical mean of s sub g set minus s sub r, or of this set, excuse me, mu hat of t intersect s sub g set minus s sub r, This is a most 2 sigma. But also, we know that mu sub good minus mu of t intersect s sub g intersect s sub r is a most 2 sigma. Because if you do the calculations, again, this is an event of um, probability at least 1 minus 2 epsilon under mu sub good. 
and an event of probability at least 1 minus quantity epsilon over 1 minus epsilon under t. And then together, triangle inequality implies that mu sub hat minus mu sub g, now 2 norm is at most 4 sigma. So I believe that this constant here is actually 4 sigma. But then with these two claims, uh, the estimator is very straightforward. All we're going to do is we're going to just brute force search over S to find a set of points that satisfies this property that it is of size 1 minus epsilon n and it is 2 sigma comma 1 minus or epsilon over 1 minus epsilon resilient. We know that such a set of points exists uh, because the first claim implies that the set S of good set minus S of bar is such a set. And the second claim implies that any such set of points will uh, give us a good estimate for the true mean. So why is this interesting? Well, it's interesting for a number of reasons, one of which is that it allows us to get inefficient estimators for robust mean estimation under bounded second moments. And we can do so by combining it with this following fact, which is also in steinhardt chart covalent, which says that if S sub good is a set of n ID samples from D, where D has bounded covariance, then if n is sufficiently large, at least something like d log d over epsilon, then s of g is a set of, is a c root epsilon comma 2 epsilon resilient set of points with high probability. And moreover, if mu sub g is the empirical mean of s sub good, then mu sub g minus the true mean of d, which I denote mu, is at most root epsilon up to constants. So in particular, this says that if s is a set of epsilon corrupted set of points from d, which if it's sufficiently large, then we can write it as s is equal to s of good union s of bad set minus s of bar where s of good is this c root epsilon comma 2 epsilon resilient and by the previous theorem this implies that we can learn mu sub g with some estimator to error something like up to constants root epsilon. And by the second part of this fact, this implies that mu sub hat or mu hat minus the true mean is also at most root epsilon. So this says that this resilience allows us to get an efficient, a statistically efficient, I should say, estimator that gets error root epsilon in the presence of noise. Okay, so this is great so far, right? Now we have two estimators, uh, the two comedian, and this uh, notion based on resilience that get us, get us the right answer in high dimensions uh, for these two problems. So the bad news is that these estimators are not, they, not only do they look more sophisticated, but they are more sophisticated um, in the sense that they are hard to compute. In fact, there are theorems that prove their MP hardness. So there is a paper by Bernholt in, back in 2006 that says, amongst other things, that computing the Tukey median, at least in the worst case, is MP hard. And you could hope that perhaps you could use more structure here, but at the very least, I don't know of any algorithm for computing the Tukey median, which does not run in time which is exponential in the dimension. I should say, actually, that this paper, uh, Bernholt, uh, in 2006, is kind of hilariously bad news because its title is literally that robust estimators are hard to compute, and it demonstrates MP hardness for a number of very standard robust estimators, including two comedian, but also others. And uh, this doesn't talk any, this, sorry, this doesn't say anything about uh, resilience. However, it was also later shown in a paper by Sam Hopkins and myself that under standard complexity theoretic assumptions, also certifying resilience to a certain degree is also MP hard. So this kind of sucks because now it seems like you had two choices. Either you could uh, use an algorithm which was inefficient, but got the right statistical rate. But then I couldn't run this algorithm in high dimensions. So I couldn't run this algorithm in say more than like 20 or 30 dimensions. And so it's not very useful for high dimensional data. Alternatively, I could use one of these efficient algorithms in high dimensions, like these uh, more naive things like component wise mean or median, excuse me, or truncated mean, but then my error is scaled poorly with the dimension. So my statistical performance suffers. But then it's not clear why it's useful in any number of dimensions, say 20 or 40 or so. So the question is, how do we scale these things beyond this to actually high dimensional data? 
So this is the question that we are going to tackle starting next lecture, where we're going to start to develop the machinery to get efficient algorithms uh, for these problems um, that also get the right statistical rates. That's it. See you.